All right, good morning, everyone. I think we have a, a relatively small class today because I know a lot of people are off in D.C. So I, I have to just tell you guys, I mean, this is one of my, my foibles as a teacher. I, mean, I, I was bragging about how I've been recording all these classes. Well, as it turned out, I hit the wrong microphone. So I have not been recording these classes because it's been waiting for an input rather than the actual microphone. So I got the first two classes recorded. And I did, if, if you need them, they're up on YouTube. But now YouTube is challenging me because uh, I have that recording from T.S. Eliot. And so YouTube is telling me I have to take it back down because I violated copyright because we listened to Eliot in class. So anyway, um, I, I will take it down because I'm not going to mess with, I'm not going to worry about being sued in class um, for that. But if anybody needs that class that we talked about, the hollow men, Basically, just email me and I'll send you the recording that I have. But I think, uh, unless I've screwed something up, we should be recording now. And as long as I don't play anything from Elliot, we should be okay in class. Uh, I think I can actually have copyright over my own material, but uh, we'll see. I also, I got the Dropbox down to 1.6 gig. So hopefully uh, you should be able to access that now. Uh, for free. Again, as I, I told you guys, I do not want anybody paying money to Dropbox. Uh, I'll figure out Canvas before I want you to pay money on Dropbox. Uh, so, and I should probably figure that out anyway. But anyway, just uh, make sure you do not pay and don't, don't, <laughs> don't use your parents' credit card or anything. <laughs> to pay for, for Dropbox. So if you have a problem, just let me know. Okay, so what we're going to do today, we, we have talked about this one great figure, T.E. Holm, and we talked a little bit about his ideas, and he really is kind of the first Christian humanist of the 20th century. And then we have this figure that I want to talk about as well, Irving Babbitt. But before we get to Babbitt, I want to try and sum up some of these things that we're seeing as a development as an anti-progressive movement at the beginning of the, the 20th century. So I know that you guys all had uh, American Heritage. None of you have, are in this class who haven't had American Heritage yet. But I don't know if you remember this one piece that we had from uh, a guy by the name of Walter Lippmann who wrote a piece called The Dominant Dogma of the Era. And I, I want to just briefly read from that from the American Heritage Reader and that, that argument that we had, if I can pull it up here really quickly, uh, because he makes this great comment that basically everything in the world at the beginning of the 20th century has become in some way ideological. And we even see that at the beginning, for example, of the Commonwealth Club Address by Franklin Roosevelt in which he says, I want to speak not of politics, but of government. I want to speak not of parties, but of universal principles. They are not political, except in the larger sense in which a great American once expressed a definition of politics, that nothing in all of human life is foreign to the science of politics. In other words, there is no getting away from politics. Everything is in one way or another political, all things have become politicized. But this is what Lippmann says, and he wrote this in 1938 as he's trying to think about all this rise of these various ideologies in the 20th century. He says, In the violent conflicts which now trouble the earth, the active contenders believe that since the struggle is so deadly, it must be that the issues which divide them are deep. I think they are mistaken. Because parties are bitterly opposed, it does not necessarily follow that they have radically different purposes. So I want to imagine that for a moment, especially going back to Lippmann's argument here that, that you all had in your American heritage. What does that mean that we can have these parties that are absolutely divided and just hate each other to the point where they'll do anything to ravage one another, but they're really not that dissimilar? I mean, you think about... Think about Christians themselves. Think about just, and I, I won't even name denominations, but you can imagine there are certain denominations that will never, ever get along with one another. And what's interesting about those denominations is they actually, from the outside perspective, are very, 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 very much alike. They have 99.9% .9 things in common, but it's that point percentage point of a difference that they absolutely dwell upon when they think about each other. You could go to their liturgies and they look almost identical, but they just go against each other all the time because of how similar they actually are. Whereas you get a group that maybe isn't that much alike, 
They're not as violent towards each other as those that are alike. And so when someone like Lippmann is writing in the 1930s, he clearly means that when we look at the communists and the fascists, we see that they are adamantly opposed to one another. And one of the great conflicts that we'll see in the 20th century is this conflict of the left and the right. But one of the things that a Christian humanist tries to explain and tries to get at is that this division of left and right is merely a political division. It's a division here and now. And what matters most is not the conflict of left and right, but instead the conflict of what is man and what is anti-man or what is God and what is anti-God. In other words, we're trying to think about the nature of the human person, and we don't necessarily want to divide them left and right. But this is what Lipman is saying that the world is doing in 1938. It's divided between this left and right, and yet the fascists and the communists, the Italians and the Germans on one hand, and the Russians on the other hand, actually have far more in common with each other than they don't. And you know, this is something we, we can talk about throughout the semester, but there is no doubt that fascism in particular, Mussolini is deeply, deeply influenced by Lenin, deeply influenced by Lenin. And Mussolini had been a Marxist prior to becoming a fascist. Fascism in some way is only the flip side of the coin of communism. They both are advocating almost full state control of things. The only thing that fascism allows that communism doesn't, at least in theory, fascism allows for corporations to arise. Whereas communism, in theory, doesn't allow for those corporations to arise. But otherwise, their view towards their own populations tends to be the same. You know, obviously, in a place like Nazi Germany, Jews are absolutely hated to the point where they're massacred. But that was no different in Russia. The communists were adamantly anti-Jewish, and they had several Jewish plots and several pro, uh, pogroms against the Jews within the Soviet Union. So we talked about the other day these kind of dreadful numbers where you have 205 million people being executed by their own governments. Right? Imagine two out of every three Americans if that had happened here in the United States where we have these massive killings going on on these huge scales. Well, those are obviously against similar sorts of people in places like the Soviet Union and in places like Nazi Germany, where you have the gulags or the Holocaust camps, but they are adamantly anti-Semitic. They're also adamantly anti all kinds of things. You know, one of the things we don't take into account, the Nazis, for example, killed 21 million of their own people. They just imagine that. Now, they do that in a very narrow time frame. So the, the, what we call Auschwitz, right? The, what is Auschwitz, and what we call the Holocaust camps, really didn't go into it. Auschwitz was created around 1936, 1937, but it was a labor camp. It wasn't the kind of Holocaust camp that we think of until the actual creation of the mass killing devices like the ovens uh, about 1942, 1943. Regardless, and it, it, the killings are outrageous. <laughs> Between about 1942 and 1945, you know, roughly 21 million people are killed. Of that number, though, 6 million are Jews, but that leaves an extra 15 million that we hardly ever talk about. Those 15 million were almost evenly divided between Lutherans and Catholics. In other words, out of the 21 million people, that the Nazis killed. Six million were Jews, but about 15 million were Christians, either Lutheran or Catholic. That, that's astounding when we think about those numbers, and that's not to denigrate in any way the numbers of Jews who are being killed, but it's to put into context that this movement is not just an anti-Jewish movement. It is a deeply anti-humane movement, and that's exactly the kind of thing that Lippmann is trying to get at, do we really want to say that the Soviet gulag is any better than the German Holocaust camps? And he's basically saying, even though fascism and communism hates one another, they hate each other, there's really not that much of a difference between them. So here's how he continues this, and I think this is absolutely right. The intensity of their antagonism is no measure of their divergence of their views. 
There has been many a ferocious quarrel among sectarians who worship the same God. Right? That's, that's incredible right? in the way that Lippmann is putting this. There have been many a ferocious quarrel among sectarians who worship the same God. Although the partisans who are now fighting for the mastery of the modern world wear shirts of different colors, their weapons are drawn from the same armory, their doctrines are variations of the same theme, they go forth to battle singing the same tune with slightly different words, their weapons are the coercive direction of life and labor of mankind. Their doctrine is that disorder and misery can be overcome only by more and more compulsory organization, and their promise is that through the power of the state, men can be made happy. Right? This is everything that these people are trying to grasp. So, throughout the world, in the name of progress, this is Lippmann again, in the name of progress, men who call themselves communists, socialists, fascists, nationalists, progressives, and even liberals are unanimous in holding that government with its instruments of coercion must, by commanding the shape how they all shall live, direct the course of civilization, and fix the shape of things to come. They believe in what Mr. Stuart Chase accurately describes as the overhead planning and control of economic activity. This is the dogma which all the prevailing dogmas presuppose. This is the mold in which are cast the thought and the action of the epoch. No other approach to the regulation of human affairs is seriously considered or is even conceived as possible. The recently enfranchised masses and the leaders of thought who supply their ideas are almost completely under the spell of this dogma. Only a handful here and there, groups without any influence, part of the people we're talking about in this class, isolated and disregarded thinkers continue to challenge these notions. For the premises of authoritarian collectivism have become the working beliefs, the self-evident assumptions, the unquestioned axioms, not only of all revolutionary regimes, but of nearly every effort which lays claim to being enlightened, humane, and progressive. Right, so only a few are trying to counter these ideas. So universal is the dominion of this dogma over the minds of contemporary men that no one is taken seriously as a statesman or a theorist who does not extend, come forward with proposals to magnify the power of public officials and to extend and multiply their intervention in human affairs. Unless he is authoritarian and collectivist, he is a mossback, a reactionary, at best an amiable eccentric swimming hopelessly against the tide, and it is an extremely strong tide. So those are the weirdos we're talking about this semester. Those people who would be essentially the mossbacks or the reactionaries or the eccentrics who are swimming against the tide. And just to finish here, what Lippmann says, no doubt there has been despotisms which have been more cruel than those of Italy, Russia, and Germany, but there have been none in the history of the world which have been so inclusive. Right? And of course, everything is involved in these various de despotisms when we think about Russia, Italy, and Germany. So you may have fascism on one side and communism on the other side, but they really are flip sides of the same coin, doing the same things to their people, organizing their governments and their states and their ways of life in the same ways, and trying to create power over everybody. And this is what Lippmann says we have to take into account. So who are these people then that counter this or try and go against these progressive ideas of the fascists and the communists and the liberals and so forth? So when we think about these groups that we're going to talk about this semester in this class, there are really five different groups overall that challenge these progressive notions. So the progressives have 99% of the field, and those who are challenging the progressives are these small groups of people, but these are the people that I want us to talk about, and of course we're going to think most particular about the humanists. So when we list these groups, and I want to list them one through five, when we think about who and what they are, I want us to try and think about the kind of challenge that they are making to the prevalent progressives of, of their day and age. Turn off the projector. So, 
Number one, obviously we're going to be talking a lot about the humanists. Those people like T.E. Holm and Babbitt and Paul Evermore, up through Russell Kirk, uh, a variety of different people who are challenging progressivism by basically asking what is our understanding of the human person? How do we understand what the human person is? How do we understand the human person's place within society? How do we understand human dignity? So the humanists are first and foremost. But then we have another group of people that we'll talk about somewhat in this class and who are related to the humanists, but indirectly. These are the agrarians. And we have a couple of different types of agrarians. We're going to have to have a point A and a point B. We have a whole group of people in America called the Southern Agrarians, who are actually more of a literary movement than they are anything else, and we will talk about them. But these are people like Robert Penn Warren and people like Alan Tate, uh, a number of great Southern figures, David Davidson, who are really writing about not what the South is in particular, but about what the nature of culture is. In Britain, you have a whole group of people, and David and I were talking about this right before class starts, but you have a whole group of people who are also agrarians, mostly led by G.K. Chesterton and Hilaire Belloc. They call themselves distributists. And what they mean by that is that in a society, we should have as much property as possible owned by as many people as possible. And so when they call themselves distributists, they mean this in the sense of the distribution of economic power among a variety of peoples. And they, this is where I think as Americans, and especially those of us coming from a place like Hillsdale, it gets very confusing. We tend to think of the free market as capitalism, but these distributists adamantly were opposed to capitalism because for them, capitalism meant control of corporations. And so they argued, and Belloc and Chesterton argued, that their form of government would be one that was far more free market than a capitalist one, because the capitalist form of government tends to concentrate power in the wealthy, whereas distributism would allow for actual distribution of property among people. So you think about the American experience, our whole frontier, and especially the privatization of land, uh, through what Abraham Lincoln had through the Homesteading Act of 1862. This would be the kind of policy that the distributors had, that they wanted to get as much property as possible to as many people as possible and allow that to be distributed in that way. Regina. How did they understand distribution um, to the people? If it, like, how did they reconcile that with the overcontrol of the government? Yeah. Because wouldn't the government right. have to be the agent of that distribution? and also be in power to take property away from anyone who's getting like too rich? How does that not become like right. more of a right. um, so it's great. socialism or something? Yeah, it, well, and that's the criticism of it, that by its very nature and the fact that they want to distribute land in that way, that you are giving too much agency to the government to allow it to do it. So I mean, that's one of the great criticisms of their distributism. But the point I want to make here is that, and I, I'm, not, I'm not a distributist at all, but I think they're trying to challenge the normal progressive understanding of trying to collectivize all property, whereas they want to try and, and, so they would think of it in this way, that when you have a corporation, you allow for the stock to be distributed as much as possible, not concentrated in the hands of the wealthy, but distributed to just normal people. And so the laws should benefit. I mean, you're gonna have laws regardless. You're always going to have corporation laws. So how do your corporation laws work? Do they benefit the wealthy or do they benefit the average person? And that's the kind of thing where they're thinking about, well, if we have corporations, let us at least make the laws benefit normal families rather than benefit the corporations themselves. So you think about what happens even in a place like, I mean, just a map, and again, I'm not a distributor, so I'm probably not great, and I'm also not an economist, so I'm not great at explaining this. But imagine if you went down to Handmade and you got sick. They gave you food that made you sick, and so you decided that you wanted to sue them. You would definitely be suing an individual owner 
Whereas if you've got sick at Burger King, and you're probably going to have a much greater chance of getting sick at Burger King than you will at Handmade. But if you get sick at Burger King, you're suing a corporation. And that's part of the way our laws work. So it's almost anonymous when you sue Burger King as opposed to Handmade. And that's, those are the kinds of laws that the distributors <coughs> thought were unfair because people could hide behind the corporate label rather than allowing them to be held responsible individually for those kinds of things. So again, I'm not a distributist and I'm not an economist, but those were the kinds of arguments that they were trying to make. So they, they argued that, and this is uh, Belloc has, and again, David and I were talking about this right before class, but Belloc has this famous argument, the twin pillars of evil in the modern world, communism and capitalism. Right. And so they actually thought they were the true free market people in the way that they were thinking about property and land. So, but your objection is well noted and, and well taken into consideration, definitely. Okay, anybody else on this? So this is great, and thanks, Regina. Excellent. Okay, so these people are thinking in terms of what is property and how do we allow that property to be distributed and be distributed justly in some way? All right, the third group are the kind of people who would oppose the second group, and these are the people that we'll call classical liberals. Those people who still believe in the 19th century understanding of liberalism as kind of free markets and free minds. And so they would argue that there needs to be as much freedom as possible in the economy to allow property to move as quickly as possible from one place to another. And when we think about people like Ludwig von Mises, he would be really the kind of ultimate classical liberal in the early 20th century, arguing against the possibility of distributism as well as arguing against the possibility of socialism because of what Mises would and then Hayek would later call the calculation problems. That is I mean, exactly the kinds of things that Regina was just asking about. How could you allow the government to really understand what prices are and what property is when it really has to be this thing that is determined by custom and by tradition and by the free exchange of ideas as well as of monetary values. So they're very skeptical about any kind of controls, whether it's the distributists or whether it's the progressives. They're very concerned about this. So someone like Mises and later Hayek would be a perfect example of these 19th century liberals who don't allow for their liberalism to become collectivized, like most liberals have allowed because they've really become progressives more than liberals, but they maintain this old tradition and they want to figure out what that means. So number four are a group of people that uh, will never, for better or worse, will never be accepted by society, but there was a whole group of them. They were somewhat related to the classical liberals they called themselves the anarchists. And there were respectable anarchists. That, again, they will never, they will never ever in society, most likely, I mean, make any real headway. But there are a number of English and American anarchists who are really concerned with the nature of government and with the idea that any government at all is detrimental to the health of a society. So I don't want you, when I say anarchist here, I don't want you to think of bomb-throwing anarchists of the late 19th century. These are pretty peaceable, very well-to-do anarchists. The most famous of the anarchists was a guy in America, and we'll, we'll talk about him, a guy named Albert J. Nock. Uh, last name was N-O-C-K. He was probably one of the single greatest proponents of the liberal arts, which is how we really remember him more than we remember his economic theories. But he was one of the, he was a professor of the liberal arts at Bard College, a uh, fascinating guy in all kinds of ways. But certainly when it came to his own economic theories, he was adamantly anti-state. And he, he wrote a book very famously in 1935 called Our Enemy, the State, uh, which was one of the most important books of the 20th century. I almost had you guys read it, but it's actually not that great of a book. Uh, but I almost had you read it. it. It's pretty dry, actually, and is not as exciting as it sounds like it would be with a title, Our Enemy, the State. 
<laughs> I mean, that, that just seems like it should be riveting. Uh, but it was really a kind of a micro look at the New Deal and an antagonistic look at the New Deal. But it will influence. Uh, there are a lot of people it influences. William F. Buckley, who will found National Review, is deeply, deeply influenced by Nock. Russell Kirk, who will be the great cr creator of post-war conservatism, was deeply influenced by Nock. Uh, Frank Chorderov, who would be another anarchist, was deeply influenced by Nock. But someone that probably all of you are familiar with, who was deeply influenced by Nock, was Laura Ingalls Wilder and her daughter, Rose Wilder Lane. They, too, were Nockians in some way. They didn't take it quite as far as Nock did, but they were influenced by Nock. So Nock was a pretty amazing figure uh, in his writing. He was a great writer, actually, uh, in his writing, but in his defense of the liberal arts as well as his attacks on government. And his argument ultimately, and we can get into this uh, if you want, but his argument ultimately is that society is always based on the notion of mutual relationships and that any time that power becomes involved in that, it allows for a real distortion in our societal relationships. And we'll bring this back up again later in the semester, but I do want you to know that, that this guy, even though he has the label anarchist, was pretty important in terms of trying to figure out what this whole movement would be against the progressives. Okay, and then we get to the fifth group. And the fifth group is one that might seem relatively obscure, but they will become more and more important throughout the whole 20th century. And these are the people that we label fabulists, people who are actually writing science fiction, dystopian fiction, fantasy. So in the beginning, we have someone like, and G.K. Chesterton was already up here with the distributists, but he's down here with the fabulists. His book, Napoleon of Notting Hill, one of the great early dystopian novels. Uh, and then, of course, we'll have Brave New World in 1984 and that hideous strength. The scouring of the Shire at the end of The Lord of the Rings. Uh, we'll have a whole variety of people who are really challenging. And I, and I would make the argument, and we'll talk about this later in the semester, uh, in the second half of the semester, but I would make the argument that all science fiction as a genre by its nature is anti-progressive, even if it's promoting progressive ideals, because it does allow for this incredible flourishing of the imagination and the real seeing of possibilities that can't quite be put into a formula. Uh, by its very nature, science fiction is an anti-genre genre because it doesn't allow for conformity. Uh, even if it may promote conformity within its own writings, it as a genre is deeply anti-authoritarian uh, and has to remain that way because of what it allows and the way that it promotes that. So those are really the five great groups who are fighting this kind of progressivism that's going on. So remember what Littman said. These guys are mossbacks. They're reactionaries. They're ex uh, amiable, eccentric, swimming against the tide. There are only a few of them. There aren't that many, and yet these are the people we're going to be talking about in class, these people who are really trying to challenge these ideas of authority. And again, as Regina brought up, and I think it's pretty important to note, there are great differences in these groups. So the distributists and the anarchists are not going to be alike, and yet they both hate authority, and they see authority in different ways, and they see uses of authority in different ways. They're not going to fit with the classical liberals, and yet there's something that has to bind all of these groups together. So one of the great books that comes out in 1953 is this book, The Conservative Mind, in which Russell Kirk, as certainly the founder of post-war conservatism, Kirk is trying to bring together these five schools of thought into a kind of cohesive understanding of what needs to be conserved in society. And he says there are six things that hold these various groups together. And, and I want you to know these six things. And again, I think we can agree or disagree, but there are six things that he says hold these groups together and allow for this contrasting view against progressivism, allow for the development of something beyond progressivism, and allow us to see society in ways that the progressives simply can't allow. And I, 
I guess I'll throw the gauntlet down for a moment, and we can either take Kirk seriously or not about this. His argument is that progressivism is ultimately seriously challenged because of its conformity and the kinds of conformity that it's trying to promote. And so when you think about true artistry or you think about imagination, imagination can only come about when we break out of the formulas of things like progressivism. So progressivism might imagine certain ends, but its ends will always be limited. That is, its imagination will always be limited. It's only in our challenge of authority and our challenge of those kinds of things that we can actually have the possibility of really imagining what is possible in society. So there's a kind of famous moment where Christopher Dawson, one of the great Christian humanists, and some of his friends are invited by some classical liberals. So the humanists and the liberals are brought together at a dinner in London. And when they get there, they basically say to the classical liberals, we believe that you lack imagination. And they have this great debate about whether art is this thing that comes out of tradition or is a fight in some way against tradition or tries to figure out one possibility within tradition and another possibility outside of tradition and tries to combine those things. So there's a great debate over what happens in the nature of art. I think for many of us in 2021, we tend to think of the left as being very imaginative and we tend to think of conservatism as being lacking in imagination but it would have been exactly the opposite a hundred years ago where it tended to be those who were anti-progressive who seemed to have imagination and those who were not uh, to have that. So these are the six things that Kirk says really hold together these groups against progressivism. So number one, there has to be some belief in a system of laws or a transcendent order that is superior to society itself. So from an Orthodox Christian standpoint, we may say the Trinitarian God, but from a more pagan standpoint, we may say simply the Logos, which holds all things together, or we may say the natural law, but there has to be something above us that allows us to judge what is happening here and now. There has to be this transcendent object. Now, in his first edition of The Conservative Mind, Kirk calls this a divine intent. By the time we get to the seventh edition of The Conservative Mind, which is 1986, so we're now 30-some years later after the original Conservative Mind, Kirk says it simply has to be some transcendent order or body of law that's superior to us. In other words, Kirk goes from being relatively direct in his Christianity to being very indirect in his own beliefs, but there has to be something transcendent. So this is number one. There are a set of orders or laws or rules that are higher than tradition itself, but in which tradition engages and tries to understand. Number two, I think actually the, the most beautiful part of what Kirk says about trying to bring all this together, there has to be a desire for proliferating variety in society. This is what Kirk calls the principle of proliferating variety. And it means that in the natural order of things, in a non-progressive understanding of society, there is always this true diversity of who and what we are. So there's not only a John, but there is also a Peter. And even though each of them, and they're sitting next to each other, even though both of them have much in common, they're both male, they're both born around the same time, they're roughly the same age, they are radically different as expressions of what is possible. So Peter is obviously taller, and I would guess is better at basketball than you, John. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Can we say that? But there are probably things that, that John is incredibly good at that Peter is only okay at, and that, that's normal. This is the kind of thing we see in each human person, as Kirk says, each human person is a new representation of the face of God. And so God is infinite, the person is finite, but there are an infinite number of finite possibilities 
in terms of the infinite. And so I can look at all of you and I can say, you're all roughly about the same age as my children. And I could think of you in those terms because you all have a lot in common one with another. But then if I step back a little bit, someone from outside of this classroom would look in and would say, despite the fact that I'm 54 and much older than all of you, we're still a part of Hillsdale College and we have that in common as well. So there are these things, Kirk says, that always tie us together as human persons. But then there are these explosions of differences as well. Now this is not, and I think this is pretty clear, this is not the kind of diversity that we see in the modern faddish way of diversity and inclusion and all the diversity offices that are being created around the world because Kirk says what differences are our differences are really of talents and excellences and foibles rather than of the accidents. In other words, our souls themselves are diverse as opposed to the mere accidents and skin color of what and who we are. So the real diversity is that we are each made uniquely in the image of God. And this is the principle of proliferating variety. So every person, every human person born into the world is yet another new face of God. So it's not merely a repetition of something that has been there, but is actually a new face of God. And that's the principle of proliferating variety. And so Kirk says, there is something to the idea of mystery itself that we should cherish. We should allow for this mystery. We should allow for these differences. We should allow for the possibilities of difference because these are the things that make us actually interesting in the world. The fact that we are different one from another and yet hold these universal principles at the same time. And this leads then to the third point. And the third point for Kirk is that there must be a conviction that in society there are hierarchies. And this is something we cannot escape. So Kirk says, there will always be hierarchies. If suddenly we started playing basketball in the room, there is one person who will best us all in the room. Uh, but if we start having an oratory contest, there are going to be other persons who are going to come to the fore. In other words, within society itself, depending on the context, there will always be people who do extremely well and people who do only mediocre and the context matters. And it matters what kind of communities that we're forming in our own societies. And we have to recognize that because there are a diversity of persons, there will be diversities of orders as well and of communities. So this isn't, again, the kind of diversity that we see in the modern world, but it's a different kind of diversity. Basically, we are equal before the law, but our excellences determine who and what our communities are, and the ways that we, we allow for those communities to flourish. And then point number four, and again, this gets us back to Regina's question, I think a little bit ago, about how do we determine how property is distributed. Kirk doesn't get into that. He tries to transcend that. But Kirk says that of all of our rights that we have, if we think about life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, or life, liberty, and property, of all of our rights, Kirk says, this is point number four, Property is the ultimate right because property is not really about ownership of stuff. It is ultimately about ownership of self. It is claiming that I am morally capable of making my own decisions. I must take the consequences for the decisions I make for good and for ill. So when I make a proper decision, I can take the credit for that. But when I make the wrong decision, which of course is following human men and women, we do all the time, we also have to take the consequences for that. So property is the ultimate right because it is also the ultimate duty in recognizing that this is the great burden that we bear, that we are morally capable beings, and that we are always making decisions at all times, and that we have ownership over the soul itself. Now, I think from a Christian perspective, we could have some arguments in this classroom about how much is predestined versus how much is free and what we choose, but Kirk tries to transcend that as well and basically argue that there are moral decisions we make, and therefore we must take culpability and we must take responsibility for those decisions. Number five, Kirk says, 
in the big scheme of things, we must allow for tradition to be kind of the de facto understanding of how things should work. So tradition, customs, mores, norms, these things are critical to understanding who and what we are as a people and as a society, and that while we don't always have to blindly follow tradition, we should recognize that a tradition is the extended wisdom, generally, of our ancestors. So certain traditions, of course, will be false ones. And every generation, therefore, has to really decide what it does with the generations, uh, with the traditions it inherits. It can take those traditions and it can reform them, or it can dismiss them, or it can embrace them, but it has to do one of those three things. And tradition, therefore, is the default for understanding. So, as Kirk says, there's custom, there's convention, and there's prescription, and these generally, right, there can always be flaws with them, but generally, these are really previous traditions voting for what is good and true and beautiful, and we inherit those things. So this is what Chesterton would call the democracy of the dead, these traditions that continue throughout time, and therefore, we give them that kind of uh, of one-upmanship, we allow them to be a little bit superior to other things in society simply because they have been passed down to us through the experience of time. And then finally, number six, Kirk says that there should be a recognition ultimately, and this is his really anti-progressive kind of platform here, but there should be a recognition that reform is not the same thing as change. Reform is delicate. Reform allows us to take the past and to put it into a new way of understanding for the present. But change, for change's sake, is usually something that can be very dangerous in society and allows to various revolutions. And that, that I think, is the real conservatism of Kirk. But, but what I want to point out here is, of these six things, very importantly for Kirk, Kirk says they should never be an ideological program. So for someone like Russell Kirk, if you called yourself a Kirkian, you're automatically missing what Kirk is about because Kirk doesn't want to make little Kirkians. He's not interested in making you conform to his way of thinking. And so he calls these six ideas his tenets or his canons of conservative thought. And if you remember back to Western heritage, a canon is a little dogmatic truth, but it is a truth that we understand as small and therefore not necessarily something that comprehends everything, but rather makes its statement about what it knows, but then remains humble and, hum and creates humility for things that we don't know overall. But I, I, again, we don't have to agree with Kirk, but I want you to know those six things, and especially out of these five schools of thought this is really a kind of standard anti-progressive way of thinking in the 20th century and allows us, I think, to understand humanism overall. Okay, so are there any questions? There's one other thing I want to talk about today. We've only got about five minutes left. But, yeah, Aubrey. Could you go into more of like, what the difference is between um, number two, which was like proliferating variety, and number three, which was the same Yeah, they definitely blend one into the other. <clears throat> and Kirk would have agreed with that, that they blend one to the other. So there are times when Kirk is trying to limit these numbers. There are times he only gives us four canons of conservatism, uh, times he gives us five, times he gives us six, and times he gives us ten canons. So he, he doesn't want it to be an ideological platform. But the difference between two and three is that two is really about the individual, three is really about the community. So two is a recognition that each individual is unique, but three is a recognition then that because of that uniqueness of number two, in community itself, we also have communities that become individual because of the ways that they define themselves against other communities that exist. So it's really a difference between the individual two and community as we see in number three. Does that, does that answer you? Yes. Okay, good. Good, anybody else on these? Okay, so last thing today, and uh, we'll call it a day. So last thing, I, I want to bring up the next person that we're going to talk about, and that person is Irving Babbitt. 
great, great person, and we'll spend all of Monday talking about Babbitt's ideas, but I want to give you just a bit of background about Babbitt. We've talked a little bit about him in class. Babbitt is born in 1865, so in the last year of the American Civil War. He's born in Dayton, Ohio, and he passes away at Harvard in 1933. So he's not actually that old when he passes away. He's still relatively a, a middle-aged man when he goes into poor health in 1932 uh, and then passes away in 1933. Babbitt is a fascinating guy. and He's, like, he's the counterpart of T.E. Holm. Babbitt, just to give you a bit of background about who and what he was, he only wrote six books in his career, which is really not huge given how long he was writing. I mean, it's good, but there are a lot of other people, like his best friend Paul Elmer Moore published something close to 50 books uh, during his lifetime. Russell Kirk published about 30 books. So the fact that Babbitt only publishes six, I think, is telling but he was constantly writing, and he was writing all the time for periodicals, and writing for magazines, trying to get a, a kind of broad audience. But it's Babbitt, more than any other person in the American tradition, who really tries to understand what the concept of humanism as a term and as a belief is. And he tries to figure those out. So here's Babbitt's background. He's from Dayton, Ohio, as I said. He's from a relatively middle-class family. His dad was a medical doctor, but he was also a shyster. So his dad was one of these guys who basically sold snake oil. And he had this whole series of crystals that he <coughs> sold. And his argument was that when a woman was pregnant, if you take these crystals and run them over the woman's belly, it will determine whether the child is a boy or a girl. So he sold these crystals as ways to determine the sex of children, and people bought it. Right? And so Babbitt's dad was an absolute shyster, and Babbitt rejects all of that. He rejects the kind of superficial notions of his father, of his father's business. He's worried about the nature of capitalism. He's worried about all kinds of things because of what he sees in his father. Uh, his father also really doesn't want to raise Babbitt, and so Babbitt is given to other families to be, to be raised uh, and, and it's kind of farmed <clears throat> out from one to another. So Babbitt experiences New York City as a young man. He wants to kind of figure out what New York is like. And so he becomes a newspaper boy in New York. He joins a gang while he's in New York to kind of figure out what life is like. He doesn't really like New York. And so he has an uncle who's a rancher in Wyoming. So he goes out to Wyoming, and he becomes a cowboy for a couple of years. And uh, while he's a cowboy in Wyoming, his great hobby is hunting rattlesnakes. Uh, he's a really interesting guy. He loves being able to stick his hand into a rattlesnake hole, capture the rattlesnake, and pull the rattlesnake out whole. Uh, and he does this repeatedly while he's in Wyoming. So he gets that experience. Then he gets accepted to Harvard. <laughs> So not, not quite everybody's way of getting to Harvard, but he gets into Harvard. In fact, uh, his, what, what would be called at the time the equivalent of the SAT or the ACTs, uh, he just absolutely aces his board exams or the equivalent of them at the time. He gets into Harvard, he goes off to Harvard, and gets his undergraduate degree in classics, in Latin and Greek. And as soon as he finishes, he gets a job at the University of Montana goes out to Montana, teaches for two years, and then he gets a job for a year at Williams College. You guys don't need to write all this down. But then he ends up teaching at Harvard. And I'll, I'll finish with this today. And this is not meant, to, I, I say this only for a point of humor, not as a point of saying anything other than what I think is humorous about this. Babbitt applies to get into, to teach as a professor in the classics department at Harvard. And he doesn't get the job. I mean, he's very, very upset about this, but he gets a position to teach French literature at Harvard. And he says openly, because, and he is he's an expert in French as well as Greek and Latin, but he says openly he's disgusted by French because it will always be a second rate language compared to Latin and to Greek. Uh, but that's his position, and he holds that for the rest of his life. And for that, I wish you guys a good, good weekend, and I'll see you on Monday. Thank you.